this is Avery, and I'm the artist behind Idea Shop. This week, I spoke with N. Catherine Hales about technomorphism, Maxwell's demon, and markets. Catherine Hales is a research professor of English at UCLA and the James B. Duke Professor of Literature Emerita at Duke University. She is the author of books such as Unthought, Postprint, and How We Became Posthuman. Her writing is literary criticism, but I discuss philosophy of science with her in this podcast. I hope you all enjoy it. I'm Avery. Uh, it's nice to finally speak with you um, after communicating by email. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your books. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's very nice to meet with you as well. Are you familiar with the term technomorphism? Well, I wasn't until I received your question, but I looked it up uh, from the uh, URL you sent. And I understand now it's that uh, a phenomenon where people begin to think of themselves in terms of technical objects like robots and so forth. And I think uh, Sherry Turkle documents part of this in her book, The Second Self, where uh, she talks about children identifying with electronic toys that speak and such, and then beginning to think of themselves in those terms. So I think that's uh, very logical and persuasive that people would make that kind of transfer. That's so interesting. Um, I The reason I ask, I wrote an essay about that for uh, one of my writing classes, and I had found in your work, my mother was a computer, you use uh, computational eyes to describe the, an the inverse of anthropomorphization, which Dr. Uh, Lum in her essay about technomorphism describes it as an inverse process to anthropomorphization. And I found that your work, My Mother Was a Computer, had a lot of these themes, and I was able to connect uh, elements of technomorphism with parts of your work, especially the computationalization stuff, where it's mm -hmm. um, people's brains or our activities are more like computer or automata in some way. I guess my uh, the other question I would have is, um, you use the phrase technogenetic spiral in how we think um, in the context of the telegraph, which I felt also described this dynamic where you have the interplay between people projecting themselves into the environment, uh, onto technical objects, or us projecting the technical images back onto ourselves. Um, and I thought that, that was really interesting. I'm, I'm really fascinated by philosophy of science and it's... Um, it's interesting trying to get my head around these different terms and dynamics and stuff. And I know that, yeah. And, yeah. Well, the technogenetic spiral that I was talking about uh, is a kind of key idea that uh, appears in several of my books. And the basic idea is that um, humans invent a, some kind of technique or technical object um, that makes uh, certain adaptations more efficient. Uh, for example, um, the domestication of fire enabled people to cook their meat, not to eat it raw. And that changed the dental structure of early humans. And the change in the dental structure thereby resulted in a change in the skull size. And that increase the potential for further inventions following on the domestic domestication of, of fire. So the spiral works by uh, inventing an object or a technique that gives an evolutionary advantage to certain mutations. And those mutations in turn lead to more technical objects, which lead to more mutations and so forth. So that's why it's a spiral because it involves a feedback loop between uh, three different factors. One is the technique or the technical object, the other is the mutation, and then the third is the environment in which this takes place. So these sort of spirals have been uh, in operation since almost the beginning of the human species, and they're continuing, as we know, into the present day. Yeah, that's so interesting. I guess one of the ways that I think about this is um, 
in our language, we reveal this dynamic with different metaphors, right? Like it's, you might say someone has like a sharp wit, which to me is sort of implying that their, their speech is cutting like a knife or whatever, right? And so it's this um, way of comparing the qualities of the human experience with aspects of our technical world. And it's like part of this loop and this dynamic of what you're, you're saying. Yeah. I, I find it very interesting. Um, I'd like to change pace a little bit and ask you, uh, when did you first learn about Maxwell's demon and what compelled you to write about it? Well, I uh, did an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And part of my education in chemistry included a course in thermodynamics. And that I believe is where I was first introduced to Maxwell's demon. Uh, but it's a famous, famous thought experiment. And I think Maxwell proposed it in 1858, if memory serves. And since then, it's uh, remained a very fruitful thought experiment. And it uh, has had now well over a century, a century and a half of commentary around it. And one of the fascinating things for me about Maxwell's demon, which I think you allude to, in one of your questions is the fact that it keeps getting reinterpreted in terms that are uh, relevant to whatever the contemporary context is. So one of the first uh, important interpretations of Maxwell's demon in information theory was uh, the idea that the demon was sorting the, the molecules and in order to sort the molecules to sort for, sort the hot molecules from the cold molecules, he needed information. And if you take information into account, the informational cost more than outweighs the sorting advantage. So uh, the Maxwell's demon, as you know, was posed as a thought experiment challenge to the second law of thermodynamics. The thermodynamic law that um, entropy always increases in a closed system, or we could say the amount of randomness always increases in a closed system. So since the, it appeared that the demon was doing no work, the fact that the demon was sorting the molecules meant that the entropy was decreasing. And how could it decrease, which seemed to violate the second law? So the idea that the sorting imposed an informational cost was one way to save the second law, not that the second law was ever in doubt, but uh, it was a successful answer to the challenge posed by the Maxwell's demon. But then as time went on, uh, another very in influential interpretation of Maxwell's demon was done, I believe in the late 80s or 90s, by uh, Charles Bennett. And Bennett used a three-valued logic to prove that the informational cost of that sorting operation was not in making the sorting, but rather in getting rid of the information. And so that seemed to me very indicative of where the culture was in the 1990s, where uh, People in developed countries such as the U.S. were beginning to experience a glut of information. So mm -hmm. now the whole interpretation changed. It wasn't that the sorting required information, but rather that the sorting meant that you had to somehow get rid of the old information in order to get new information. Uh, so that, that was just another reflection of what you seem to imply that the interpretation of this very fruitful thought experiment does change in relation to what the concerns of the culture are at the moment. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, that that kind of gets to my fourth question. Would you say that the, the Sillard paper represents a technomorphic or a post-human turn with Maxwell's demon? Because um, in, the, in the original version of it, at least uh, the versions that I've read, it's like it's a Maxwell says the demon is not different from a person, except in his size and his agility, and it's well, like... Actually, I think that Maxwell never calls it a demon. Yeah. 
was a subsequent yeah. term imposed. Right. Maxwell calls it a creature. Right. Yeah. Reported. So yeah. it's I guess Maxwell's demon made it sort of go along with Laplace's demon and other yeah. demons and thought right. experiments. Uh, but you're right, it, the, the demon interpretation of the creature did impose a certain, a certain nuance onto the thought experiment that did anthropomorphize it. And then when it becomes not a person, not a little creature, but rather an informational function or an informational processor, that does mark a turn in information theory now thinking about signals and processes mm -hmm. and electrical engineering, not so much, uh, say, a tele telephone switchboard or something like that that would right. require a person to operate it. So yeah, it, it does mark a sort of another turn in the whole tradition of Maxwell's demon toward information processing. And of course, then, uh, let's see, the date of that Szilard paper, I think, was the late 1920s, yep. 1948, then Shannon publishes his famous volume on information theory, which takes the whole idea of information processing and puts it on a, a firm uh, mathematical basis. Yeah, and it's, I guess, the sort of fascinating thing to me with Maxwell's demon, to go a little bit back, um, one of the things you said initially is how this thought experiment has been fruitful and has changed so much over the years. Um, that's really incredible to me because I I only learned about this like a year ago. So when I've been telling it, uh, explaining it to people and trying to talk about it with like my dad, who's a chemical engineer or just other people in my life, um, it's interesting to me because it it's not, it's a physics thing, but it's not something that no one observed Maxwell's demon, right? Like it's it's obviously just a, a thought experiment. It's like a fairy tale that Maxwell came up with, like, what if there was this little creature that could reduce entropy or whatever? And it's like physicists tear their hair out about this creature under the bed, right? Like this little scary story that we tell, like, oh, you know, maybe the second law is not totally grounded because of this one um particular thing but people speculating about that has all these positive consequences for like information theory and the development of the computer and understanding um the like the mathematical formulations of information theories you said with Claude Shannon so it's just it's really interesting how this uh the, this little story had an incredible life over the past century and a half yeah, yeah, it has had an incredible life. And there are a few other examples like that, thought experiments that are so fruitful that they really generate uh, decades of controversy. Another one that I am familiar with is uh, John Cyril's Chinese room thought experiment, where uh, a guy sits in a room who doesn't speak or know Chinese and receives strings of characters through a slot in the door, then uses a rule book to match up these strings with new strings and puts the new strings out through the door. And the interlocutor outside the door thinks, oh, well, this guy clearly knows Chinese, but he doesn't know Chinese at all. He just is using a rule book. Right. So Cyril advanced that as a as a thought experiment to demonstrate that a computer doesn't know what it's doing. It's just matching patterns like the, uh, the, the man in the room. But <clears throat> that thought experiment is getting less and less uh, plausible as computers have gotten uh, stronger and stronger in understanding human language and so forth. Yeah, that's certainly very interesting. Uh... I guess another question that I have related to Maxwell's demon. Um, in Chaos Bound, you say, what are computer programs used by large investment firms for stock trading, but demons of the second kind? From random fluctuations in the market, they extract information and money, thus justifying Maxwell's intuition that the second law of thermodynamics may have left something out. When I read this passage, I thought of Philip Murawski's uh, book, More Heat Than Light, which discusses uh -huh. 
a metaphor between value and energy. Um, is your description of high frequency trading algorithms as a type of Maxwell's demon influenced by this book at all? Um, and if not, how did you make the connection between Maxwell's demon and the, the HFTAs? Well, I think at the time I wrote that passage, I uh, had not read uh, Philip Morosky's book, so was not influenced by that, but it was influenced by a short story by Stanislaw Lim uh, called uh, The Siberiad. Mm -hmm. And in the volume, The Siberiad, there's a book, there's a story, a fable uh, about uh, Pug the Pirate who collects information, extorts information from this, the people he captures in his domain. And he demands that the constructor robots make him um, an infinite information machine. And so they construct what they call a demon of the second kind. And mm -hmm. clearly a demon of the first kind is Maxwell's demon, but their demon is a little demon who has a, a very fine pointed crystalline pin. And as random molecules of air form configurations that are sentences or words, the demon scribbles the words down on an infinite tape. And so out of the random fluctuations of air molecules, every once in a while, a word will appear and the demon captures that word at lightning speed. And uh, as the tape begins to accumulate, it wraps around the pirate pug and eventually entombs him in it. Mm -hmm. So it, it was that fable I had in mind when I was thinking about the high frequency trading programs making uh, money out of these small incremental fluctuations in trading values. So like the demon of the second kind, they're capturing yes. little bits of value as they float by and translating them into money. Uh, so, you know, the whole idea is that basically these fluctuations are random and just by chance, you can sometimes catch them in a configuration where you can make money off of them. Right. Um, I, I found that so fascinating. I, I found out about your work through reading Philip Morosky's Machine Dreams, um, which I guess is why, because he cites Chaos Bound in that, um, with your discussion of Maxwell's Demon. And so I like, I got a copy of that book and I read it. Um, and it, it immediately stuck out to me that that metaphor worked. I'm, I'm really, thank you for explaining that. And I'm glad you walked through that because it, it makes sense um, as, a, as an informational demon, absolutely. Uh, but the, the metaphor to me worked on another level, which is this, this value energy thing where um, you're comparing the Maxwell's demon, the energy thought experiment to high frequency trading algorithms, which are doing like, value creation through the disorder of the markets. And I thought that that was, it's, it's incredibly prescient to read something like that from 1990. And then, you know, today, uh, or last year, right, like, with the GameStop stuff, you're reading about payment for order flow, and like the different ways that uh, firms make money using those algorithms It was really, yeah, uh, quite an experience. Yeah, yeah indeed, indeed. <laughs> So in Unthought, uh, you discuss non-conscious cognition of trading algorithms, and I couldn't help but think of Chaos Bound. Um, is there a particular reason that you didn't explicitly connect the high-frequency trading algorithms to Maxwell's demon in Chapter 6 of Unthought, like you did in the introduction to Chaos Bound? Uh, no particular reason. I certainly could have been connected, as you're yeah. suggesting. But uh, each book that I write kind of has its own dynamic, its own internal dynamic. And in the ideas I was developing in Unthought, they just didn't run in the same channel as in Chaos Bound. So uh, I could have made the connection, I just didn't. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's not a, it's not a criticism or anything. Like that's, that's probably one of my favorite chapters out of... Uh, 
out of your books um it's just it's i as a reader because i made the text to text connection with chaos bound i felt that that really enhanced the um the chapter uh but anyway um in chapter six of Unthought, um, you report on two solutions offered for the negative effects of high frequency trading on markets. Um, one is the investors exchange slowing down trading so it's closer to human perception. The second is batch auctions, um, which would force trading algorithms to compete on price and not time. You also say that these changes, if implemented, could have far-reaching impacts upon culture and social life. Can you offer an example of what some of these changes uh, might be? Well, I think uh, what I was thinking of was not so much those particular techniques as the thinking or the dynamic behind them. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the um, IEX slowing trading, uh, what I was thinking of were all the trends in contemporary culture, which deliberately turn their back on the idea that faster is better and emphasize the value of uh, slowness. So we have the slow food trend, you know, that the idea is not to eat your food as fast as possible, but to, uh, in fact, make it into a kind of ritual and slow everything down. A colleague of mine offered a course in slow reading, which I thought was a marvelous idea. So they took one novel for the entire term and each uh, week they would only take one chapter of this novel. So the chapter might only be five or 10 pages long. And when you have a three hour seminar to discuss you know, a 10 page passage, you tend to look very, very closely at exactly the way that passage is constructed and what gives it its dynamic and so forth. So it's a wonderful way to experience close reading and understand how literature works in all these complex ways that include embodiment and breath and so many other facilities, not just uh, cognition, not just uh, brain thinking. Uh, so the slowness is one aspect of that. Then the second aspect about competing on price and not on time ties in for me with another whole movement within the society that we see now of not trying to overturn capitalism, but to make capitalism work in more beneficial ways. So the latest exemplar of that, I think, is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry for the Future, where he is trying to show how you can take market forces and make them work, in his example, for the health of the planet, not the destruction of the planet. So he imagines that... Um, in the future, there will be the invention of carbon coins, which allow people, oil companies and such, to make money by sequestering oil rather than by burning oil. So that's just one example. But the whole idea that maybe capitalism uh, can be turned to beneficial uses, not only exploitive uses, I think is an idea that uh, many people are interested in now. So that, that kind of ties in with uh, competing on price and not time, because really what you're talking about is a market mechanism which can be turned from something that has bad effects to something that has more fair effects. And it's that general idea that I thought would really have a transformative effect on many cultural activities. Yeah, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for walking through that with me. Um, I definitely, when I first read it, um, the thing that came to my mind was more if we had a, a slower culture, maybe there would be an emphasis, uh, not that social media technologies would go away, but there would be a kind of less emphasis on something like a Twitter or a TikTok, where it's all about tiny bits of things that are delivered to you, like the most amount of information in the, in the smallest portion possible, the things that allow 
um, more longer form things. So I guess thinking on the fly, this would be like stuff like podcasts or long form interviews um, is really a trend away from uh, like the TikTok, uh, Twitter sort of. Yeah, sphere. absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's part of it as well. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. The uh, the second thing that the, the batch auctions about um, trying to reform capitalism too, because the carbon coin stuff like that sort of does exist with renewable energy credits, um, that there are markets for, for carbon that the state forces companies to purchase to meet like a certain amount of their emissions to meet renewable portfolio standards, right? Yeah. Carbon um, credits, yeah. Right. And they like have to retire them by just not selling them and just holding them on their on their books. And um I like I don't know if it's if it's effective um or not, but it's certainly something that's uh being tried. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think carbon coins differ from carbon credits in that they're more fungible. Okay. Is that uh, they they would function as a form of currency? They would trade on their own market, like gotcha. do on the stock market and so forth. So they're a way to take the idea of carbon credits, but to generalize it into currency in its own right. That's so interesting. I'll have to read that book. That sounds yeah, fascinating. I think it's a very good book. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, I guess. Related to currencies, um, I'd like to ask you, do you have any thoughts about Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies, or so-called non-fungible tokens? Um, in My Mother is a Computer, you describe a story where a group creates a digital, currency, uh, a digital currency that is, quote, backed by a vault of gold that can't be accessed, or there's a question about whether or not it can be accessed. And then in How We Think, you discuss how people anticipated that you would be able to do like wire money transfers with the telegraph early on and that this is like a dematerialization of value. Um, so I guess my question is, are cryptocurrencies or non-fungible tokens the post-human realization of exchange value? Yeah, I see. I see where you are, are coming from with that. Actually, I hadn't thought about cryptocurrency as uh, post-human realization of exchange values, but it certainly makes sense in that it is now making absolutely clear that money is a fiction. And uh, let's see, I guess Jake, Jacob Goldstein, I think, has this book called uh, All You Need to Know About Money and why it's a fiction or some title like that. And he makes the point that after, I think it was what, 1978, when the US went on, uh, abandoned the gold standard altogether, that after that, everything was fiat money. That is money that isn't backed by anything other than the fact that people believe in it, or more precisely, people believe in the ability of the US government to back that currency. Um, so once money is entirely fiat, then there's no reason why it can't go completely digital as indeed it has, because there's no underlying asset in any of that. You know, all it has is exchange value. It doesn't have any conceivable use value. So, um, so I think that's a, that's a very good way to say it. Yeah, it's a further progression of this already fictive entity into the digital realm. And then the fact that uh, you can now uh, make a image of LeBron James or something into a non-fungible token is uh, a way to try to recover the uniqueness of a particular art object. But um, I don't know how successful that whole marketing yeah he's going to be i guess it's quite uh quite volatile yeah. as it should be because uh the idea that you can take an image which exists in hundreds of thousands of copies and right. somehow make it into an art object that has value in itself is so counterintuitive that uh i can understand why that market is so volatile yes absolutely um i 
by asking you these questions, I know this sounded a little naive. I'm not uh, like a fan of cryptocurrencies or anything. I was just more, I'm more interested in the, uh, like the philosophy of science and the literary perspective about them, right? Um, and I, I do agree with what you're saying because the, um, the infinite replication of, of something like an NFT is also like, it's also a problem for Bitcoin because people can just copy the source code of that and start their own coin, which is either literally the same or just like with different permutations. And it's the, the amount of like computers running these programs is okay. relative, yeah, relative to how valuable it is. Right. But it's, um, it's, it's dissimilar to something like gold because there's a fixed amount of gold in the universe. And like, you can just code up another Bitcoin 2.0 or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. It's, it's interesting to me that the source of value has gone from something like gold, a stable, uh, limited uh, entity to computer time. So uh, now what's valuable is the time of computation, not this right. uh, tangible asset. And of course, blockchain has many problems among them, the profligate use of energy resources to do all these computations. And the longer the blockchain gets, the more computer time yep. you have to spend on it. So it seems like a highly counterintuitive economic move where you're spending vast amounts of resources to generate money or to legitimate money. But in the meantime, the energy for all those computations is also limited. So you're yes. using up energy resources, you're generating heat into the atmosphere with all of those computations. So those are hidden costs or costs which aren't taken into account in the generation of cryptocurrencies, but nevertheless, they're actual costs that exist in the world. So like so much in the developed world, you have one ledger accounting for right. what's recognized by the establishment, and then you have another ledger with all these unrecognized costs. And Absolutely. you factor in the unrecognized costs, you get a very different picture of what's valuable and what's not. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, absolutely. I had a thought in my head and it just, it slipped out of my mind. Uh, maybe it will come back to me. Well, if you don't mind, let me ask you a couple of questions. So, yeah, of course. Uh, you're, you're a student now, is that correct? Yep. Um, I have an associate's degree in uh, general studies and I'm a liberal studies major at, uh, I'm uh, 25. I'm going to be 26. Um, I, I'm not really sure what I want to study. I think I want to study philosophy, but other times it feels like maybe I want to do finance stuff. Um, I remembered what I was going to say. Um, I don't know if you've read the Benoit Mandelbrot book, The Misbehavior of Markets. Um, I haven't. I've read others of his books. Yeah. On the last page of that, he says that he he would hope in a future world that people would like donate some of their clock cycles to like protein folding programs or um, a program that would find macroeconomic correlations to try to like validate his fractal view of markets. Um, and I read that last year and it struck me as really funny as just kind of like a monkey's paw wish because you you wish for macroeconomic correlations and people like trying to do good for the world but actually what you get is this blockchain stuff that just like increases co2 emissions and like people just scam each other with um which i i don't know uh <laughs> i i don't know what Vandelbrot would think of that but um it's certainly an interesting uh an interesting thing uh, but i'm i'm sorry uh Right, it's, right. it's yeah. the opposite of what the Ministry for the Future is doing. It's taking right. something that's intended to be good and turning it into an adverse factor. Yeah, right. yeah. Absolutely. So you're, uh, you're not sure what you're aiming for in your education, but you're thinking about philosophy and possibly finance? Yeah, or economics or something. Um, that really seems to be, I had a really good time with econ 
one and two, but I basically just wrote papers the whole time. Um, and I, I really enjoy philosophy a lot. Like it's basically been a, a, a passion for me throughout my life. So um, it feels like something I should study. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, sure, whatever you're interested in. Yeah. When I was at uh, your stage of life myself, um, well, it really, I was younger. I was contemplating what I would do in, as a major in college. And I, I had two major interests, one in science and the other in literature. And I chose to go the science route because it struck me as so improbable that I could ever make a living from literature. So I did an undergraduate degree in chemistry and then I started a graduate program in chemistry. But as I got further into research, it seemed to me that the questions were getting narrower and narrower. And I felt a hankering to ask broader questions. So then I essentially changed fields completely and started graduate study in literature with almost no background in it. And that was, a, that was a, a difficult but rewarding choice in the long run. It was difficult because I had to work very hard to make up for lost term time. But what I learned from that was that um, the most important ingredient in my view in education is whatever you're passionate about. And if you're passionate about it, somehow it will work out. So I, I give that advice to my students when it seems appropriate that, uh, if that if that ingredient of passion is not there, then probably your vocation won't be ultimately satisfying to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, I, 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 I understand that when I have these conversations with my parents, that's often what it comes back to. And it's like, you got to do what's going to make you happy and what makes you feel alive every day and not like. Yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. And you know, the money will somehow take care of itself. Right. It does seem to in the long run in any event. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a just a couple more questions for you in how we became posthuman you say what embodiment secures is not the distinction between male and female or between humans who can think and machines that cannot rather embodiment makes clear that thought is a much broader cognitive function depending on its for its specific Let's start over with that rather embodiment makes clear that thought is a much broader cognitive function depending or its specificities on the embodiment form and acting it. I found this passage particularly affirming of transgender personhood. Were non-binary or transgender people in your mind uh, when you wrote the emphasized passage, specifically uh, what embodiment secures is not the distinction between male and female? Well, it, it wasn't on my mind, but I recently read a a wonderful article reinterpreting again Alan Turing's uh, famous thought experiment there, the imitation game. And this uh, writer pointed out that um, gender is really essential to that argument, even though it's quickly switched to human and computer rather than gender. But in the initial version of the imitation game, Turing imagines a man and a woman with an interlocutor. And uh, the woman is advised to answer cor uh, accurately, correctly. Well, it's the man who is going to try to pretend to be a woman. Then uh, the woman drops out altogether. And now it's the man and the machine. So it's the masculine element which continues in the version of the imitation game, revealing that the woman in the initial thing is uh, not really part of that exchange, mm -hmm. that she's just there to kind of perpetuate the conversation. She's a nullity in that whole exchange because all of her responses are supposed to be factually correct. Uh, so this writer was drawing attention to this aspect of the imitation game, 
and showing the way that the imitation game in a sense erases the possibility of a genuine feminine response that would be equivalent in the masculine response that the whole dynamic there is weighted toward masculinity at the erasure that depends on the erasure of femininity so i think that um that is all relevant to transgender dynamics as well. The way that that works out and the substitution of the machine for the woman is, I think, particularly relevant here. And it does sort of point to the, uh, the way that gender is constructed, that gender is not a, a set category, and it certainly is flexible in that version of the imitation game. That's so interesting. Uh, thank you for describing that to me. Uh, I'll have to look at that essay at some point. Um, it's not, I... It's, it was, uh, I think, 1950, and it's called Mach Can Machines Think? Yeah. Very famous essay. Um, I know the Turing, the Turing paper, but the, uh, the person reinterpreting it, because um, I, I recognize the... Um, the original formula of that again from uh Murawski's machine dreams he kind of makes like a little bit of a snide comment about alan turing's um situation with the way that he uh originally formulates the question as, as you had said so I'll, I'll have to um do some more research about that that's really interesting um i guess i have one final question for you um the following passage of how he became post-human reminds me of neoliberalism and how the market is privileged as a supreme information processor. Junk is the ideal product because the junk merchant does not sell his product to the consumer. He sells the consumer to his product. He does not improve and simplify his merchandise. He degrades and simplifies the client. Do you see your work as explicitly critical of neoliberalism's degradation of the general populace's ration of cessation abilities? Well, uh, that passage comes from William Burroughs, I believe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, William Burroughs. It does? Is, yeah. It's not I, you. I'm so sorry yeah. about that. No, that, that's yeah. William Burroughs. Uh, and, you know, William Burroughs himself was a heroin addict. So yeah. he knew whereof he spoke when he said that uh, junk degrades. Okay, that's what that's about. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. I read that on Goodreads. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. Oh, this is so embarrassing. That's really well, funny. Um, no, it's, I mean, Burroughs had an excellent yeah. point there. And one thinks about how relevant that is with the opioid uh, crisis in this country and, you know, the way the whole market works. I guess uh, didn't uh, Purdue Pharmacy just settle yes. a big lawsuit, billions of dollars to state six billion or something like that. Yeah, it's almost unimaginable figure. So, uh, so we're fully in the grip of what Burroughs was describing. But uh, as to neoliberalism, um, I tend to write a little bit of slant from direct political issues. Uh, partly because I don't trust myself to not get too angry. Uh, that you know, I fear if I yeah. get really angry about something, I'm going to lose the critical edge that enables me to write it all. So certain topics I approach sort of uh, slant-wise, not directly. And I would say neoliberalism is a part of that. The uh, chapter I just finished in my the new book I'm working on on ministry for the future takes on that takes on neoliberalism very directly and makes a lot of um, points about the way that liberalism and then neoliberalism constructed the liberal humanist subject in ways that really solidified economic and uh, racial uh, disparities and inequities that are you know, still very much with us today. Certainly. And it's suggesting a new kind of uh, large philosophical configuration that I call um, ecological reciprocity, 
which aims to reorient, reorient these attitudes in a different direction. And I think it's also very much related to the environmental crises we have today as well. That uh, at the center of this is anthropocentrism, the elevation of human abilities above every other creatures and uh, according, uh, accordingly granting dominion to humans over everything else in the earth. And I think that really needs to be addressed and rectified by a movement toward a new biophilic and uh, biophilic and earth friendly philosophical viewpoint. I'm sure you're familiar with Rosie Bradotti's work. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Post-human knowledge discusses the anthropocentrism stuff. I read that um, a couple of weeks ago and it, it really, it reminded me a lot of elements of your work, but it also, um, I, I'm a vegetarian and I found it very affirming from that perspective too. And it's, I, I've always had very uh, just like caring feelings towards animals and like, I don't want to hurt them or anything. And I've, I've, whenever I read that sort of philosophy um, or like hearing you just speak now about the importance of not emphasizing humanity's particular situation relative to the world. I, that's something I've felt throughout my life and I appreciate the um, intellectual explanations for it, I guess, because it's always just been a like thing that I just feel like when I look at pictures of penguins or like when I see my chickens or when I pet my cat or whatever. Yeah, uh, I I guess the reason that quote stuck out with me with the neoliberalism stuff um, is not so much the Purdue Pharma, but the way that market dynamics like simplify people's demands almost that it's um, to get back to like the Twitter and the TikTok stuff. It's a certain segment of the population wants as much information as possible in like the tiniest little parcel they can get. Um, because of constraints of daily life and, and, and whatnot. Um, but this reduces a lot of complexity and nuance that exists in the world yeah. um, and results in people taking like stronger, uh, more partisan positions about stuff or whatever. Um, and I just, I... Uh, <laughs> I feel very embarrassed that it's a Burroughs quote still, but I think that it's um, it's really insightful about not just uh, junk in like the literal sense, but junk in terms of like, like if I, I don't use social media that much anymore, but when I used to like scroll through Twitter or look on Facebook, right? It's like, it is just junk, like junk food for your brain. It's not useful or intellectually stimulating. Um, and it, it does work to, to simplify the consumer of it in some sense. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. yeah. It's junk, yeah, so yes. you said, in another sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very excited to read um, your, your new book. Um, and I'll have to check out the Kim Stanley Robinson book. It sounds so interesting, uh, yeah, especially I, the carbon coin thing. Yeah, I think you'll like it. Well, it's a pleasure to talk yeah. with you, finally meet you virtually yeah uh, best of luck with your your work thank you so much um it's, it's i really appreciate uh your work and thank you for your time this has been uh wonderful if i have any follow-up questions can i just reach out to you via email yeah, sure okay. that'd be fine all right thank okay you so thank much. you bye nice you. take care i think that went well I think we did it, boys. So that was my philosophy of science interview with Catherine Hales, and I guess episode one of the Idea Shop podcast. This was kind of a one-off, very special thing for me. So I'm not 100% sure how often I'll do these. Maybe I will write podcast episodes just about the books that I've been reading or something, if this goes over well. Let me know what you think. If you've read Catherine Hale's books, let me know what your favorite Catherine Hale's book is. Mine is probably Writing Machines and Unthought a second.